So my name is Tang Yung and I'm a developer advocate on the Ads DevRel team. Uh, I work directly with publishers who have uh, major or custom integrations with the Google Ad Manager API. I also work with uh, publishers who have, uh, who have the mobile SDK to integrate to their apps. So after today, you can find my work on the PHP client library on GitHub, or you can just like request a, an office hour meeting with my team uh, through your ad manager, uh, account manager at Google. So today, when we talk about a better design, I want to split it into speed, accuracy, and reliability. First, let's take a look at speed. A common business objective is to keep a local copy of your ad network, and there are good and better ways to do this. Right? The end goal is to bring the data closer to the consumption sites. And uh, for the reason that you want to save the network bandwidth, API access coder, or simply to make it accessible and compatible with your in-house in data analysis software. So later today, my teammate Donovan uh, will walk you through the use case of building a data warehouse. For now, let's take a look at the nuts and bones of a very simple application that will get online items. Uh, Google Ad Managers provides two different APIs for you to achieve this goal. In, this ca in the case of line items, using the line item service is an intuitive uh, way to do it because of its matching name. This specialized service can return strongly typed objects, the line items objects, uh, which will enable your modern IDE of most programming languages to do static code analysis and then offer uh, our code autocomplete, code highlighting, and type checking for you. Here are the high level steps for getting the line item by statements. And these steps are copied directly from the Python example on, the, on our GitHub repository. All of the code examples on this GitHub repositories are also available in other programming languages as well. For simplicity, I modified the GitHub example a little bit and uh, to remove the loop and fetch only the first 500 line items, so the first page. And this is my first tip of the day for you. Consider a page size that is more suitable to the object types that you're, you're expecting to get in return. Uh, all of our examples use the, the default page size of 500 uh, explicitly just to demonstrate the fact that developers have the control to tweak this number to your uh, specific cases. Then the rule of thumb is that the page size can be a large number uh, for smaller objects like key value pairs, which don't have a lot of properties, right? But if you are fetching line items and you are a sophisticated ad network, you have a lot of tar targeting rooms, you may want to reconsider about a page size loading like fewer than 500 line items. Uh, you will need to balance the need between reducing the number of paging requests with the size of each of the payload. Right? To get the first 500 line items, you start with creating a local instance of the service and then build a statement. Uh, lastly, you call the service to get the line items by the statement. One thing to note here <coughs> is that you can only specify the where, order by, and limit clauses of the statement. The select part is missing here because the service will always return the complete list of properties. There are many ways for you, for you to profile the code. An easy way is to enable the SOAP logger, which is built in in the Python client libraries. We also have similar built-in loggers for other programming languages. So this code snippet, while it is specific to Python, but the work to enable logging should be as minimal as a few lines of configuration change or code change in your application. The default logging level is info. This log level gives you the short version of the, of the successful API request. For failed request, we add some more information to it. And one of the important thing here is that you can find a request ID in the error summary of a failed request. 
And this is my second tip of the day for you. Please always include this request ID in your communications with our support team. Effectively, it allows us to look up, search for your API request in the 20 million API requests, as Alex showed you the number earlier, in our service logs and speed up the diagnostics. So coming back to our simple application, I changed the logging level to from info to debug. Uh, and the purpose is just to see the full SOP requests and responses. The generated log file in this case is only 2.5 megabytes. But as you see, this is just a test at network. The second option for you to pull the line items is to use a general purpose uh, service. It's called Publisher Query Language Service. While this service has a different name with line items, it does support querying various kind of data. And you can easily look up the table names in our reference doc on the dev, guy, on the dev site, including uh, these tables, including the line item table. The return type of this service is a row class that requires you as a developer to do some extra steps, like checking for null, accessing the value by the columns index, and perform save type casting. The upside is that this service supports sparse select statements. You can select just the fields that you need and leave other fields out of the request and responses. If your app business has sophisticated targeting rules like hyperlocal, uh, you can save a lot of data being transmitted over the wire and also being processed by your application servers. That's why it could be a clear winner for speed and resource if you have the flexibility to make the selection of the fields. So here we have the snippet to pull all of the 16 fields of the first 500 line items. I cheat. I put the dot, dot, dot there. But like the idea is that if I put 16 fields, all of the fields that I have in the line item table, uh, the steps are quite similar to the previous example. But the key difference here is that you, you, can, uh, you can specify all of the clauses, including the select statement. And the, the size of the SOAP block has reduced from 2.5 to only 1.6 megabytes. This is not a lot because it's just a test network. However, if we write a rows to the disk, you can see that uh, we, we can get the CSV file about 500 kilobytes when you get all of the 16 fields. Now, if we don't need the targeting info, we can leave that out of the sparse select statement. And uh, the result C CSV file is much smaller. And in this test network, the CSV file size is reduced by five times already. So the key takeaway is to search for the table in the publisher query language services supported table and use sparse select statements to improve the speed of your application whenever possible. But what if you still need to sync all of the fields of all of the line items uh, from your ad network? For that, we would recommend you to do uh, an initial sync uh, to pull all of the line items down with all of the fields, and then subsequently to do a partial sync to, to get like just incremental updates. It is more efficient for you to do a daily uh, to do a daily partial sync than to do a fully fetch up all of the line items after six months. And this chart is showing you uh, like the accumulated changes, including adding and updating line items in my test network that has only like a few changes a day. And I'm pretty sure on your production network, you have much more traffic than this. To do a daily partial sync, you need to specify a time window of the changes. The code snippet here is specific to Python uh, to get the exact midnight time and then look through each of the day in the past 180 days. The time window is then passed to the statement builder to compare with the last to compare with the last modified daytime. It is important to know that this field, this last modified daytime field, only gets changed by user actions. So if a line item which automatically expires after certain days, such automatic change wouldn't impact this field at all. So you can reliably use it to do a partial sync. Next, 
let's go over how to improve the accuracy of the API application. So if you are building a UI to let the users pick the, a daytime, it would make more sense to, to uh, make the UI so that the user will pick the daytime in their local daytime rather than your ad network daytime. In case if you have an offshore team or if you have a global operation team. But the, the user local time may be different than the default network time zone on the network. So in this example here, uh, you can see that I'm using Singapore as the local user time zone, which is different with all of us here. Uh, from the UI, you can let the user pick a local daytime like that. And then in the code, you will specify the time value that they pick with an explicit time zone like this. Indeed, the Python client library will throw an exception if you miss this argument. The code snippet above generated this soap log where you can find a filter statement. And in the filter statement, the daytime parameters contains the Singapore time zone as part of the request. However, when you inspect the response in the SOAP log, you will find that any time values uh, being returned is in a different time zone. Indeed, it is in the default, in the network default time zone. And this is also true with reports. So no matter how you set up the input and uh, request the report in whichever, from whichever time zone, the response, the report is always in the time zone of the ad network. So the key takeaway here is that uh, you will have to convert both the request and the response to the user time, user's local time zone. Uh, this is true for all API transactions, including reporting. The next objective is to accurately process each entity exactly once. Anybody has an idea why we have to do this? OK. This may be an important technical requirement rather than a business requirement. Because sometimes you have to build an in-memory dictionary, or if you have a unique constraint in your database, when you fetch the line items or something, and then you write to the database, Right? So you will want to do like inserting exactly once. Otherwise, you get some uh, database constraint violation exceptions. Right? Uh, it is a common pattern to get line items by uh, using the uh, get line item by statement and then iterate through the results. And every time, every time that you issue a request, you will get a page uh, of results back. The count of line items in all of the pages can change if there is a change concurrently happen on the server. For example, suppose that you have, uh, suppose that you're requesting 500 line items uh, that were modified yesterday, and suppose that your page size is is 100, then you're expecting to get five pages, and as you process, as you proceed to page number three, and some user just update one of these like 500 line items. The next page request, the page number four, you will, if you inspect the total result uh, set size, you will see that the count has reduced to 499. So this happened during the loop. And you will be able to detect such concurrent you know, updates because the total result set size will change. And uh, this currently is a limitation of our API. And we're, we're aware of that, and we will be uh, including that in the next, like including a solution for this in the next iteration of the, in the next uh, design of our API. For now, the best practice is to request a small amount of line items so that you minimize the chance of a concurrent update and also inspect this total result set size to detect the changes. And then it's up to you as the application designer to decide whether you want to redo the whole fetch or just like ignore the the fact that some records move from one page to the other page if you order by the last modified date time, or if it uh, go to the next pool, next uh, subsequent sync. So for reliability, I would like to discuss about how uh, to deal with exceptions in API applications. Our support team often see tickets uh, related to unknown enum values. Uh, essentially, 
whenever you have releases, uh, whenever we have new releases of the API, we have uh, new enum values that they cannot be backported to older versions. And if you want to get the exact persons of these unknown enums, you will have to update your applications to a more recent version of the API, specifically by updating the, the stream. In Python, uh, this is as simple as updating the version stream, as I show here. Uh, when you instantiate a service and the statement builder, another tip of the day for you, specifically for Python, is that you can skip this version string in Python. The, the client library will use a default value, which is always the latest version of the API. So the next time that you do a pip update or a package update statement, it will just like update to the latest one. So you don't have to recompile your code or rebuild your code and push to production. Another common request uh, to our support team is that uh, what to do when you receive a server error. Well, there are different kinds of server errors, and some of them are just transi transient errors. And what that means is that sometimes the server gets too busy, or your uh, request, your page size is too big, or whether the reports that you are pulling uh, just have unexpectedly a very large number of rows, like 50 million rows. Right? Uh, this, this can happen as a temporary outage. Uh, you can also check our Google Ads dashboard, a status dashboard, to see if there's a, a widespread outage or not. If there's not, then chances is that the next time that you retry, most of the transition errors will go away. And uh, for this transition error, you can use a strategy called exponential backoff uh, to retry at a different time uh, every time that you retry. And if you know that your request has too many records, then a good strategy is to also like change the, the request size every time that you retry. That way you can see whether like it's actually the request size that makes uh, it time out during processing or gathering the data right into to the disk and transmit to your server. If you have done all of the, all of the things that you can and you're still stuck, so please uh, just reach out to our support team and include some of the info here, like the request ID, very important for us, and then the network code and the date time of the error. So that will help us to like search for your request and see on our server log like what's happening. And last but not least, let's see what we can do with report errors. So our recommendation to you as a developer is that you should always use the UI to build a report because that's where we put a, uh, that's where we put a lot of effort into building an extensive system for uh, validating the input and give you real-time validation uh, messages, including if you select some certain metrics or fields that are not uh, supported by the API, it will also give you the, the warning of that. Right? So uh, when you build the report on the UI and then you save it as a saved query. You can use the API to pull the saved query and execute it. Sometimes when you have that saved query or someone send you a saved query and you pull that, you may get a server error. And uh, when you open it, you look at the SOAP log and you see, hey, the report definition is empty. The chances is that you have some metrics or fields that are not supported by the API. So the API is just rejecting it and not returning you the definition of the report query. And then you cannot execute it. So if you still have difficulties running the saved queries that you know that it would work in the past, then just contact our support team and we'll ask you for the saved query IDs besides the request ID uh, as I showed before. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you.